And so um, today's topic is tropical fruit. It's one that is near and dear to me. Uh, so I uh, grew up on a tropical fruit farm down in the Redlands. And up on the upper left-hand corner is my uh, dad holding a big uh, jackfruit and uh, um, when he always tried to entice me to come back uh, to the farm as much as possible, usually he put me to work immediately, uh, but he always had a big bowl of fruit for me. And some of my favorites are uh, sapodilla and mame and uh, sweet sop or anona squamosa. And someone who knows all about these is our Miami-Dade um, extension agent, Jeff Wasilewski. Uh, he is a, a master, uh, not, he is a specialist, not in the true sense of the word, but he specializes in our, um, in tropical fruit. He is the commercial tropical fruit crops extension agent for Miami-Dade County. He has a wealth of experience. Uh, he has a master's degree from the University of Miami, bachelor's from FIU, and uh, uh, associates for Miami-Dade. And he has been writing and teaching about tropical fruit in South Florida for over 20 years. He really is our go-to guy. He does lectures, field visits, publications, video, and social media all around tropical fruit. And, you know, that's, that's the fun part. Um, and some, sometimes Jeff has to do the tough part too, which is tackling the uh, issues like laurel wilt, wilt and, um, and our invasive uh, insects that come in and really try to help keep the farmers nimble and aware of the, um, of the threats that happen to the tropical fruit industry. So a lot of times he's put on the hot seat, but always comes out uh, the hero. So welcome, Jeff. We're so happy that you're here uh, to share your wisdom about tropical fruits with the Florida Master Gardeners. And I'm going to stop share. I'm going to give you an opportunity to share. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Are we good? We're good. Okay, so my internet here is pretty bad. So if I go away for a second, I'll come back, don't worry. So my name is Jeff Wasilewski. I'm the Commercial Tropical Fruit Crops Agent for Miami-Dade County. And we're gonna talk about tropical fruit today. Just a quick crash course all you ever wanted to know in less than an hour. So as you guys know, Extension has an extension office, our University of Florida has an extension office in every single county, all 67. We also have research centers. I'm lucky down here in Homestead to be able to work with the Tropical Research Education Center, TREC. Uh, so there I have a tropical fruit specialist, a tropical fruit entomologist, a tropical fruit plant breeder, so I get to work with them, a pathologist, and uh, if I don't know the answer, then they surely will. So I also do something called Tropical Fruit Tuesdays. It's about once a month. Our next talk will be on aftercare, and that will be August 17th. Then we're gonna do propagation by cuttings and the lychee on October 19th. So if you wanna get on the email list for that, just email me. So I always like to start with um, where can I get information? Where's the best place to get information? So we have a new platform called Ask IFAS, which is all the EDIS documents. That's your best go-to place. And you guys as master gardeners know that, that it exists, but it now it's got a new platform. So it's very nice. Um, if University of Florida doesn't have it, I would suggest going to another university so you can search the topic and then EDU to find it, like we don't have a lot of breadfruit. So if you search breadfruit EDU, you'll get information from University of Hawaii, which is very good. YouTube is good, we know, because you can see everything that you're learning. And you, if you watch more than one video, let's say three or four, you get the gist of what's going on, even if the information isn't perfect. I do have all my Tropical Fruit Tuesdays there on YouTube. So if you search in YouTube Tropical Fruit Tuesday, there's about 15 of them at this point. A great place to get information is Master Gardeners. I am a Master Gardener. Uh, I, I was a Master Gardener. I started out that way. Uh, you guys, you know that you're a great source of information as well. Another good place to get information is your own garden or your grove. Uh, if you go and you see it in your own garden or your grove, then you know it's true. So very 
very good place to learn things. Uh, and then also beware the source of your information. Everything you read isn't true. Just because you see it as the first answer after you search it, that doesn't mean it's correct. Okay, so we're gonna talk about tropical fruit is the name of the talk. That's the name of my um, job title. But you see the true tropics are here in pink and we're out of the true tropics. We're in the subtropics and we do have plants like um, lychee that need a certain amount of chill hours to properly bloom. Things like mango and avocado, they, they like a good cold front to get their, their bloom set. So we're not so tropical. Tropical means it never freezes. So we're not exactly tropical, but um, commercial subtropical fruit agent doesn't sound as cool. So we're gonna stick with tropical. So my job is pretty easy, like Wendy said, except when I'm dealing with things like Laurel Wilt, um, because this is the passion that you get with tropical fruit. You can see that this person is just going to town on that mango. So speaking of passion, I was giving a talk to the master gardeners in um, Naples, and I gave a talk very similar to this one. And then we went outside and they have a, a fruit garden. So I gave them a tour of their own fruit garden. I came across this uh, carry mango. There's two fruit there that the only two fruit that were on the tree and the bigger one had Josephine's name on it and her phone number, a smiley face. And then it says on the bottom here, you touch, you die. So that shows you the passion. Josephine's ready to kill to get to keep her one carry mango. And how do we know that? Because she put her phone number. She's very, very serious. She didn't just say you touch, you die. She put her number and said, hey, give me a call. We'll see wh whose mango that is. So Josephine, if you're out there, I think I'm gonna call this number soon and see if I can get in touch with Josephine because she's been in many of my talks. So the first part of my talk today, we're gonna talk about some different fruit and specifically some of the questions you might get on those fruit. So we won't go too deep into these fruit because we don't have that much time. Um, I do 45 minutes on mango and lychee and avocado on the Tropical Fruit Tuesday. So we will just touch on it. So jackfruit, one question you're gonna get is, I have flowers I have little fruit and they're turning black. So what that actually is, and jackfruit is here, it's the largest uh, tree born fruit in the world. Here's, you see the inside. So here's a male jackfruit flower, very smooth. And jackfruit have both male and female flowers separate on the tree. So there's a female, you see it had all these ridges. And when the tree is young, it only puts out male flowers so they turn to, to black like this on the left. So when the tree is young, people are gonna see these, what they think are small fruit, and then they're gonna turn black and they're gonna think something's wrong, but that tree is just not big enough to, or old enough to hold these big fruits. So here's a female on the right that's getting bigger and is ready to be pollinated. Okay, so Sapodilla, we're just gonna show you some of the information that's available in Ask Ifus. So if you go to Ask Ifus and put in Sapodilla, you'll get um, a very good document on growing Sapodilla in the home landscape. So you'll find the origin, the size, relatives, all kinds of information, propagation, planting. Then you also get a chart like this. And we have this for most of the tropical fruit. So it has all the months. It has when you fertilize, when you do micronutrients, including iron, when you irrigate, when you look for insects, disease control, which sapodilla is not a problem. Uh, after harvest is when you do your pruning, when's frost protection and harvest. So you have all this great information for you when people ask you these specific questions, you can show them these charts. And then we'll also have information on how much fertilizer to put. So another one, another tropical fruit is mame. Uh, this is a magania, you see, cause it has a little little beak. Um, so mame needs some minor elements extra. They need a little water and they have multiple crops. So you have a 
MMA like this that has the mature fruit and it has smaller fruit that are coming for next year. Now, the reason why this is important is because I'm gonna to touch on pruning at the end and you always prune after you pick the last fruit. So my main never has a last fruit. So it's very difficult to prune them because you're always gonna be cutting off some fruit. So I know I said that they need uh, minor elements. So this is typical iron deficiency of a MMA. So you see the green veins and yellow rest of the leaf, that's iron deficiency. And that is something that will show up on MMA. You give it some good chelated iron drench and it will come back to life. So another thing about MMA is they're just brown. They don't turn a color when they're ready to pick. So you have to nick them. You see on the left here, the nick, and uh, you see it's green underneath. So these are not mature, they're not ready. But on the right, you see it was nicked and it has, uh, it's orange underneath. That means it's ready to be picked, it's mature, and it will ripen on your countertop. Canistel, uh, someone mentioned egg fruit pie, I think. And Wendy said she's having a hard time liking canistel. Um, I would say it's a very good tree. It's very nice. Um, it's easily managed, the fruit. Um, they're, they're something that you could like if you put a lot of cream and sugar with it and made ice cream out of it. I think it might, might work out. Uh, and they do that in Peru. There's a fruit called lucuma that's very similar uh, and they make a lot of ice cream products out of that. And um, they also like the fruit. Uh, my girlfriend is Peruvian and her parents really like lucuma. So I get, and lucuma won't grow in Florida. So uh, I gave them a canistel tree with a fruit that looks similar to lucuma called Ross. Uh, and they think it's lucuma, they love it, and I'm a hero. So that's my canistel story. Citrus, you're gonna get a lot of questions about citrus. People are really trying to grow citrus, but citrus greening is a big problem. And I don't know of any real citrus trees unless they, you just bought them that don't have citrus greening or you're doing a really intensive program like they do at University of Florida. So on the right, you have a lychee tree that has iron deficiency. You see both sides of the midrib are the same. They look very similar in color. On the left, you have a citrus leaf that has citrus greening. And you see the midrib, you see it's splotchy. There's some yellow on the left, but some green on the right, and it doesn't match up. That's typically citrus greening. So that's a big problem for citrus. Whenever someone is having trouble with citrus, have them send you a picture if it looks like this then you have to give them that bad news that they have citrus greening, the roots are gonna slowly die. There's not too much you can do. I know some of you are, can grow some citrus and get some fruit. If you give them a little extra water, a little extra um, fertilizer, they can, their life can be a little bit longer. Avocados, another bad story um, is laurel wilt but you also have the avocado lace bug. This will be the question that you'll get the most is you'll get leaves like this on the left and then they'll say, what's wrong? And if you look underneath, you see these little avocado lace bugs. Now the good news is these typically pick up when the leaves are about to drop off. So you'll see this damage, the leaves will drop, the new leaves will come, everybody's okay, you don't need to spray. So that's a good, nice ending to a problem. But then we have laurel wilt. Laurel wilt has killed over 140,000 commercial avocado trees and many, and many landscape trees as well. Um, it moves by a tiny ambrosia beetle that carries a fungus to grow for its young. The beetle drills into a tree, grows the fungus in a gallery to feed its young, but the tree hyper, is hypersensitive to that fungus and blocks off the fungus but it actually blocks off its own um, vascular tubes and it can no longer get water. So you have this wilt that you see in the picture here. You, here you have like three trees right next to each other. Um, so if someone calls and they say, my tree has just turned 
brown. And all the leaves, and then ask them, are the leaves staying on the tree? If they are, then that's nine times out of 10, that's lower wilt. And you see these trees are right next to each other because older trees, if the roots are touching and they're grafted, they can move the disease through the roots. So here's a grove that was completely killed by laurel wilt. Anything green that you see there uh, is a weed. So here's a grove that still has some trees on the outside, but lost a lot of trees on the inside. Like I said, we've lost about 140,000, over 140,000 trees. The beetle signs, sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't because they put these little holes and they'll push out the sawdust or these little crystal um, volcanoes here. But if you get a good rain, those are gonna wash off. You might still be able to see the tiny holes. But if you chip into the wood, you'll see the holes and you'll see this sort of staining. That's the, the xylem where the fungus blocks the, the water from getting to the leaves. So that's avocado. Lychee, another bad story, and I'll get to some good stories later, but lychee, like I mentioned earlier, uh, it needs a certain amount of cold temperature. It needs banked up cold hours to properly bloom. So South Florida, we typically don't get enough. We just got it this year, so we had a bumper crop, but typically we don't get enough of those banked hours, so we have a poor crop. A little bit further north, you'll have a better chance. They also like a more acidic soil, so that's good. Our, our pH here is very high. So because of that, they need some minor element help. They can decline very rapidly if they're not getting fed properly, and they like a lot of iron. Uh, so I mentioned this has a bad story to it as well. This is lychee arenose mite. This is a new pest, LEM. It's highly specific. It attacks only lychees, nothing else. New leaf flushes are the most susceptible. Uh, and it makes these little, the first thing you'll see is probably these little warts on the new leaves. That's LEM. They're microscopic. And then after that, they form this sort of red hair, a red hairy brown mass. The mites are too small to see with the naked eye, but you do see the damage. It'll feed on the fruit, flowers, leaves, just the, the stem, just about everything. And it can move by uh, air currents and bees. It's, they're very small. They can just get blown around. So Florida is the leading producer of lychee in the country. And what high percentage of that is found in Miami-Dade County. So here's a map of all the commercial acreage. So you can see we can grow lychee all the way up here. I don't know, you guys are a little further north, I think. Well, you're all over the place, so you could be getting any of this. Um, but these are the places that we have um, commercial lychee. And then here's where the, the LEM has been found in 13 counties. Uh, sorry. In all these different counties. So you can see just about everywhere we have commercial lychee grow, we have the, the pest. And it came in here in Lee County. If you suspect you have a light urinos mite, the state FDAX is still trying to eradicate it. So you can call their helpline 1-888-397-1517, or you can email them DPI helpline at FDAX.gov, or you can contact me and I'll get you in touch with, with them. Okay, carambola doesn't have a big, huge problem. Um, it's something that is pretty easy to grow. It can give you multiple crops. It does like a little wind protection if you can give it. Uh, and also it, it will need some minor elements, especially since it's putting out two to three crops a year. Uh, anonas, on the left we have a sugar apple, on the right we have soursop or guanabana. And these guys will get a seed bore that will bore in and then a fungus will get in there. So you'll see sort of a, a mummification of the fruit. So 
What I like to do is keep my trees very clean. Any fruit that get mummified, I get rid of them. Um, and I really keep no fruit underneath the tree as well. Try to keep good culture. Okay, so we'll, we'll try to end up here with something happy, some mango cultivars. Mangoes at this point, cross our fingers, don't have any huge issues. Um, so there's one called Cogs Hall. These are cultivars or also called varieties. Um, here's the Cogs Hall in the, in the for, forward part of the picture here in the foreground. And there's a cack in the background. You can see it's much bigger. The Cogs Hall tree stays pretty small. It has a heavy bloom, but sometimes it doesn't set all that well. One that does set well is Fairchild, very disease tolerant, uh, smaller tree, and uh, it's yellow, but it has great fruit, no fiber. None of these that I'm gonna show you have any fiber. Uh, Malika, that's another one. This is the only true Indian mango that works in Florida. Uh, other ones won't, they just won't grow here because of our humidity. This has good commercial potential. Uh, and Wendy earlier was asking me about the Fairchild um, Tropical Botanic Garden Mango Festival. So these are all ones that were highlighted there. Cogs Hall, Fairchild, Malika. Uh, I actually volunteered or worked there for 24 years in a row for the Mango Festival. And uh, I sold the trees for most of that time. So we put out thousands and thousands of trees to homeowners and commercial groves alike. Uh, Neelum, this one's later. It's small, uh, late season, very productive. Rosy gold, this one's very early. So late, what that means is August to mid-September. And then early means April to May. So rosy gold is one I have in my home. I have Fairchild at my home. I have most of these here at, at work in our grove. Rosy gold is a winner for sure. Angie, another winner. I have an Angie here that fruited for the first time um, this year. Really great. Okay, so now is the time when I would usually take a break and we could all get up and get some water or, or, um, or go to the restroom, but we're gonna push on because I wanna make sure that we have time for um, questions at the end. So we're gonna to go to the second part of the talk, which is tropical fruit CSI. So the question you're gonna get, the, the number one question you're gonna get when it comes to fruit, and this is not just tropical fruit, these are other fruit that I don't know anything about growing like pomegranates and things like that, um, and figs. So the question you're gonna get is why won't my tree fruit? My tree is not fruiting. So if people have a fruit tree, the number one thing they want is fruit. They don't want a shade tree. They don't want a pretty tree. They want fruit. So these are the questions that I would ask. And I would ask all these questions, not one, and then get the answer and then try to solve it. I would ask all these questions. Is it planted in the full sun? Is it planted too deep? Does it have mechanical damage? What's the irrigation schedule? Does it have heavy pest damage? What's the overall health of the leaves? What's your fertilizer schedule? Is it a seedling? How old is it? Is it a species? Or what species is it? Um, and is it grafted? Is it a variety? Is it pruned too? Was it pruned too heavy? Was it pruned too late? And then finally, I'm gonna show you what I call the shake test, where you see if the roots are in, in good shape. So why will my tree fruit? And we're gonna go over each one of those questions. So don't worry if you didn't get them all down. First of all, you've gotta have your fruit tree in the sun. It's gotta be getting full sun all the time because the sun gives the tree energy, which allows it to flower, which allows it to fruit. So it needs full sun. Here's a lychee grove that I went to and you see a lot of shade. The trees are shading each other out. So you have you know, six feet of wood underneath the tree where there's no leaves. So you're not getting any production there. You're only getting production up on the top. So this will be somewhere that I would say you need to prune everything to get light back on these trees. 
Here's a better example of giving light to trees. Here's a mango grove. You see plenty of space. As long as you keep these trees pruned, you're going to get light on them all the time. So here's a typical home. And north is unfortunately to the bottom. It's not pointing up. But what I'm showing you is if you have a house or a large tree, to the north, you're going to be in shade. And then the sun is going to be back here. And you're going to get your evening sun over here, a lot of sun, sun over here. So you want your fruit trees back here or far enough away from the house, far enough away from another big tree that they're still getting that full sun. So beware of structures and other trees, especially if you're planting on the north side. That's trouble. OK, another big problem I see with a lot of commercial groves is they planted the tree too deep. They dug the hole and then they just put the tree in and they didn't find the first flare root, which is the level that you want to put the tree at. Here's another problem. They put in this black sort of mucky soil and didn't use the native soil. So this is going to cause, cause some issues because um, it's going to, it's going to, take water and get rid of water at a different rate as the rest of the soil. So you don't want that. You want to just use the native soil. So proper depth. Here's a mango tree and I pulled away the, the mulch. And you see these flare roots, one to the right, one to the left, one in the back. They're all right at ground level. So that's good. That's where you want the soil to be. That's at the proper depth. Here's one on the left that was dead, so I pulled it out. You can see here it was planted about four inches too deep. And then on the right, here's a mango tree that's in the ground that I dug and dug and dug and still could never find the first root. So we're down, you know, four or five inches and the tree is all under underground. So that's not good. So you get one chance to put that tree in the ground when you do dig the right level, look for these flare roots. The first one, put that at the level of the soil or a little bit above. It can be a little above, but not below. So here's an avocado tree that was dead. We're looking at it from up above. I pulled it out of the ground and laid it down. So we can see a lot of issues here, why this tree died. One, it was planted too deep. So here's where it was planted all the way up to this um, tape, tree tape. You can see that's at least four and a half, five inches too deep. Uh, we don't see a flare root to way down here. Two, you have this tape that's binding the tree. You can see that's biting in, so it's girdling the tree. Three, you see up here, it was girdled by a, a string trimmer, it's weed whacked. So any one of those things could have caused a lot of damage, but all together, it's big damage. And then also you see these new um, weeds coming up and you see the old weeds are all brown. So that was um, someone sprayed herbicide. And if you don't do it correctly, the drift will get onto the tree and cause trouble. So that's four strikes. So definitely killed the tree. So here's a mango from a mango grove where they planted everything too deep. You also see string trimmer damage. So these trees were all doing very poorly. Uh, here's a guava. Again, we're looking at it from up above and you see the first flare roots are down here where the roots sort of get fatter, but it was planted all the way up here. So it was planted about mm, another five inches too deep or more. So also beware of uh, the tree tape because that can girdle your tree. Here's a hog plum, also called spondius or sorella to the left. And it has a metal tag on or a metal um, loop holding the tag on and it's biting into the tree and girdling it. Here's one on the right where I took off the plastic. You can see that it was biting into the tree. So protect your plants from the string trimmer. Here in the, is the fruit and spice park on the left. They have a nice technique where they take away all the grass for about mm, two feet around the tree. 
two or three feet. And then they put this little plastic here to protect it from weed whackers. Uh, on the right, this is my grove here. I put a lot of mulch, I put the plastic. You can see that somehow it's still got weed whacked, but can imagine what they would have done if it wouldn't have all that protection. So this is why you don't want to have string trimmer damage because most of your fruit trees are going to be uh, dicots. So they have this inside. They have the xylem, they have the phloem, they have cambium. Phloem is here on the outside. Now we're looking at this from the side. Phloem takes the nutrients from the leaves and sends it down to the roots. So if you cut that off, you're choking off your tree's nutrients. So that's why it's so bad to do uh, string trimmer, to have string trimmer damage. So you can protect in many ways. One was what I showed you here, where you just remove the soil, I mean the, the grass or the weeds to keep everything away from it. Another way is this, big circle of mulch. Make sure that you have a hole in the middle so the mulch isn't piled up against the trunk. Another way is this, this is my house. I just have this little limestone rock around the tree. On the left, you see I tried this plastic. The next day it got weed whacked and broken, so that didn't work too well. See, I have my little rocks around there. Pull the grass away, still, they still got it. Um, on the right, this was a uh, Adamoya that I'm having all kinds of trouble with. And I finally, it kept falling over, kept falling over, falling over. So finally, I said, I'm going to go out there with rebar. I'm going to stake it up. I'm going to make it perfect. So I did that, staked it up, put all this tape, held it in place, put a little thing around it so nobody's going to hurt it. So perfect. And I come out the next day and it's broken all the way down in half. You see the culprit here is a big palm frond that somebody moved and they hit my tree and, and broke it. So the best laid plans of mice and men, sometimes it just doesn't work out, but you got to try folks. Uh, here's an avocado that also was dead, but was planted at the right level. See here, we're looking at it. I pulled it out of the ground, laid it down, looking at it from up above. Uh, and you see here is the first flare root, so it's at a good level, but then you see all kinds of string trimmer damage. So that's an issue that I want you guys to correct. So here's some young trees, all protected. Uh, the other thing is, I mentioned that you're going to ask them what their irrigation schedule is when you're asking. Uh, this is a trick question because they'll often tell you very happily, oh yeah, I water uh, three times a week, an hour each time. I water every day for 30 minutes. They're very happy to tell you that, but that's probably killing their trees. This is a, a mango grove where you see in the back big mangoes that are doing fine, but the mangoes here that are next to this nursery that's getting watered every day, they're either dead or dying because they're just getting waterlogged. So too much water is a very bad thing. So that's something that you want to check. This was a guava grove that I went to. A mother and daughter team came to me and said the snails were killing all their guavas. So I didn't believe them. I asked him questions and it didn't sound right because guavas, I mean, snails don't usually kill a lot of guavas like that. So I went out to have a look. You see they have the um, guavas on this berm of, of rock. And I found some dead guavas and I found a lot of snails. Here's a snail, 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 snail. So this is an open and shut case. We got dead guavas, we got snails, let's book them. Uh, but no, these snails eat lichen. They're just eating the lichen off here. They're not going to kill anything. So it had to be something else. And here's what it was. They had new trees. They had drip irrigation, but they had these, um, these this pile of soil or pile of rock, these berms. So the water just went straight down and didn't get to the roots, which were way over here. So they just kind of died of, of uh, not having enough water. 
So great thing for you guys to do is buy a cheap rain gauge, like a $4 rain gauge, get a two by four and a bag of uh, concrete, dig a hole, put the two by four in, uh, and then put the concrete in. Then you can put the, the rain gauge at the top like this, very cheap, as long as you have it away from everything else, it'll work. And this will tell you how much rain you really get. Because a lot of times we get what seems like a lot of rain and it's almost nothing. Or we get a quick rain and it's a lot. So it's good for you to know how much rain we're actually getting. So one thing I mentioned at the very beginning was I want you guys to keep your eyes wide open and do scouting. What I said at the beginning was if you see it with your own eyes, you know it's true. Also, if you see it early enough, then you're going to be able to stop that problem. Here's some sooty mold on a mango caused by scale. And it's really to a bad extent. If we would have caught it a little earlier, if we would have been scouting, we could have taken care of that scale when it was younger. Here's a tree, a mango that has scale and it has sooty mold. So we're going to flip it over. But because we're scouting, we see these little guys, which are juvenile ladybugs. So they're actually going to eat all these scale. Here's a scale, 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 all scale. But these guys are eating the scale. So because we scouted, we don't have to spray anything to get rid of this because we know that this little guy and this little guy are gonna do major damage to the scale and they'll help to clear it up. So proper nutrition is something to think about with, with fruit trees. You basically wanna keep them in good shape. Um, you don't have to force them to grow, but you do want them to have good nutrition. A typical fruit mix is an eight, three, nine. You guys know that this is nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK. We want this last number to be higher because that's the one that really works on flowers and fruiting. So this is a typical one that we're going to use. Um, if we're going to want, if we're going to fertilize things like lychee or mangoes, this is too much nitrogen. So we want something that's got a higher potassium. So where does the fertilizer go? It goes out here in the drip line, the granular fertilizer, out here. And you're gonna spread it out. You're gonna throw it and spread it out where all these feeder roots are. You're not gonna do this. Here's a tree on the left. The crew just put fertilizer like right on the trunk in clumps. Here's a, um, a palm tree. They put all this clump all around it. So I had to get a blower and blow that all off of there so it would not, burn the roots. Another thing that you would ask them is, where did you get the tree? And they say, I grew it from seed, or they say, I bought it and this is the cult of our name. It's a Glen Mango. It's a Simmons Avocado. The reason why that's important is because if it was grown asexually, like a grafted tree, like the one you see on the right, where the bottom is the seedling, the top is where it was grafted. Then we know it's a clone of the parent, but we also know that it's sexually mature. So if it's not from seed and it's grafted, like on the left, or a seed on the right, if it's not from seed, then it's sexually mature, like I said, and it can produce fruit almost immediately, as soon as the tree is big enough. If it is from seed, it has to go through all the stages of sexual maturity. So it's a baby mango, it's a toddler mango, it's a texting mango, it's a Snapchat mango, it's a TikTok mango, it's a college mango, it's a married mango, and then finally it can, it's old enough. So maybe 12, 15 years of a tree's life before it's old enough to give fruit for its sexually mature. On the left, this top part is a clone of the parent, so it's already ready to go. So if they tell you that they grew their tree from seed, that's a tip that it might be too young for it to actually fruit. So here's a mango on the left. Here's one on the right that's so small, I wouldn't even let it carry the fruit that it's trying to have. This is a year old, or year, a tree that's been in the ground a year and it's already trying to flower. Now at that point, I would take off the flowers 
But what this is showing you is they're sexually mature and they're ready to produce as soon as they're big enough. So not the same is good for humans, not the same, not good for fruit trees. What that means is if it's asexually propagated, like these guys are doing here, and they are um, grafting these trees, then they're making clones of the parents. So they're exactly what you want. That carry mango is gonna be a carry mango. If you plant the seed of the carry mango, you're gonna have the parent, the mother was a carry, but the father was something else. So that seed is got um, diversity, which is very good for humans, but very bad for fruit trees because you want that carry mango. So it's good for the forest. You want all that diversity, but not so good for the fruit trees because if you want 50 Angie fruit trees right here to sell, they have to all be sexually or rather asexually propagated by grafting to get them to be Angie mangoes. If we were to plant Angie seedlings, 50 of them, they would just be that, seedlings. The mother would be Angie, but the father would be something else. So they would not be Angie's when they finally, 15 years later, fruit. So getting towards the end, uh, when is a good time to prune? I sort of hinted at this with um, the meme when I said, you prune after you take off the last fruit. So that's what you wanna do. What we're looking at here is a grove. And um, on the left, you have a, the, this is a mango grove that was pruned. It was pruned too late. So you have a flower, should be flowering like the mangoes on the right, but you only have like one or two flowers because it was pruned, pruned too late. So it got pruned so late that it affected the blooming cycle. These were not pruned and they're, they're all flowering well. So let's take mango for instance. Right now, you probably have picked your last mangoes or you're about to. So if we prune now, the tree has enough chance to grow back and be ready to flower and fruit. Uh, if we prune in December, you might be messing up the blooming cycle because it doesn't have a chance to put out new leaves uh, and then finally flowers and fruit. The other thing about pruning is if you prune very heavy, if you ask them, did they have the tree pruned? And they said, oh yeah, it was a big 40 foot tree. I took it down to 15 feet. That's gonna cause the tree to wanna just put out leaves for two to three years. So it's gonna take a while before that tree is ready to bloom again. Okay, and then finally, like I said, I would show you the shake test. So if you have a tree like this, that's root bound underneath the ground and you, you wanna know if the roots are doing well or not, you can take the tree. Here's a tree that we're looking at. See, I pulled away the, 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 the grass, so it's not gonna get weed whacked, although it's weed whacked here. Here you see the first lateral root, so it's in good shape but we're gonna give it a little shake back and forth. And if the whole ground moves, then we know the roots are not in the best shape. If just the trunk moves, then we know it's in good shape. So here we go, give it a little shake, a little gent. And you see the whole ground is moving. And also you see some weed whacker damage there. So that tells me that this tree is not completely in the ground ready to go. It needs still more time for it to be, see there you can see the ground moving. So if I were to have that, I would say, well, this tree needs more time before it's really um, caught, as they say. So to go back to the, the killer question, why will my tree fruit? It's all those reasons that you're gonna figure out was it planted in full sun? Is it planted too deep? Does it have mechanical damage? What's the irrigation schedule? Does it have heavy pest damage? What's the overall health of the leaves? What's the fertilizer schedule? Is it a seedling? What species is it? Is it pruned too heavy? And finally, give it the shake test to see if those roots are really in good shape. Okay, so I wanna thank you guys for your time. I left us with plenty of time for questions. 
Uh, so I'm going to take off my screen here. Jeff, we have so many questions. I have so many answers. I am so glad. So I'm going to encourage you to give not the long version of the answer, okay. the correct version of the answer, because we have at least uh, 30 questions. So the game show answer that I just- y Yeah, but I mean, I, of course, we want you to think about it, but you don't have to explain the whole concept. And the first one is, um, I, I brought show and tell. What kind of avocado is this? You're asking me? Yes. Oh. That's a green avocado. No, oh, it's a perfect. Russell. <laughs> it's a Russell avocado. I just got this from Homestead the other day. So I thought this is my show and tell. Okay, we have got to go. Um, so let's see. Um, my friend Yen Chen from Tallahassee, uh, she has a dragon fruit plant that she's had for six or seven years, has not even flowered yet. What do you think? Well, I would steer you back to all that information we just went questions. through. Okay. Check all of that. Dragon fruit are, are uh, cactus, so they could be getting too much water. They, they have that big stem. They could be getting weed whacked. Um, so look for that. Make sure it's getting full sun. Okay. Steve Snyder wants to know, plant an avocado seeds. Um, they're growing well. Will I get fruit or, or do I need to graft to my stock? And I think you talked about that, but I'll let you answer it again. Yeah, eventually you will get some fruit. Now, you don't know if that fruit is going to be great or not, because remember, it's a seedling. So it's, um, it's a mix of the, the parents. So it could be a dog. You don't know. It could be a poor fruiter. It could right. have a huge seed. Uh, and then again, it's going to take many years for it finally to be a uh, married, married uh, avocado where it's ready to have kids. Right. Yeah. We have to go through the Snapchat and the texting years. Right. That was very TikTok, fun. Yeah, TikTok. Um, I was thinking about growing lychee in my backyard, giving, given the mite issue, would you avoid it? And uh, that's from Carrie and she's in Palm Beach County. Honestly, I think I would. I would avoid. You, you because, would not. I would, I would avoid that. I would not plant the lychee because the lychee arenos mite is very difficult to control. Uh, so you're going to have issues with it. Okay. Um, mm, a person has a neighbor who has not pruned their cogshaw or ha Hayden mango for the last 15 years. Very big. Can't get the fruit on top. Is it too late to prune them now? And then furthermore, there was another question, how much can you prune a mature tree like that at any given time? So once you have a big tree, it's much harder to bring it down the size. I have a whole um, Tropical Fruit Tuesday on pruning that you guys can check out, but it talks a lot about younger trees and keeping them in good shape. But if you have a bigger tree, you can still bring it down, but I wouldn't take more than 30% at a time. Uh, and I would just, if you have a tree like this with all these branches, I would just take maybe one big branch one year and then one the next, and then, you know, keep doing that until the bees start growing back. Okay. That's, that's good advice, Jeff. I hadn't heard it described like that before. Um, okay. And um, Yvonne wants to remind us not to plant fruit trees or any trees over our septic drain field. And I appreciate that. Um, so the sooty mold photo that you showed, um, how, do you, how do you take care of that sooty mold? Well, there's more than one way. One way is with chemicals and you have your options of different chemicals of, you know, very strong and very light. Uh, because basically you're not, remember, you're not treating the sooty mold, you're treating the insect that's causing it. Um, but what I do in, in a case like even that first one where it looked really bad, I just wait for the natural predators. And you guys as homeowners, you can definitely get that if you have a good variety of plants in your yard and you're not spraying a lot of pesticides, you'll get a lot of um, natural predators. And I really encourage you to let them do their job. Right, because the 
using a broad spectrum pesticide can eliminate those natural predators. And, and that's kind of not the, how we want to set up our landscape and our groves. Um, do you know if white sapote is susceptible to same diseases as citrus? Hmm. They, I believe they are related, but I don't think it, uh, it gets uh, citrus greening. Okay. Um, Let's see. Sandra says, I've had not, I have had not much production from my mango for all the years I've had it. I did not get around to fertilizing it this year and got huge amounts of absolutely wonderful fruit. What could be happening there? Well, if you have been fertilizing steadily each year and the grass around the tree looks great, that means it's too much nitrogen. So the nitrogen will tell the tree to put out uh, leaves instead of flowers and fruit. So it's possible, this is just one answer, that by not fertilizing it, you caused it to not put out leaves and was able to flower and fruit. Or it could have just been a really good, perfect year for, for you. Yeah, I think we did have a really good mango year and I, I wasn't aware um, of that cold requirement necessary, Jeff. So maybe she just got the, got a sweet spot this year, you know? Yeah, if you think about like Hawaii, they have mangoes and they bloom sporadically throughout the year because they don't have that time where everything kind of slows down, gets a little cooler, gets drier. The mangoes are just sitting there waiting for the signal. The signal would be a nice little cold front and that about a month later, you see the flowers come out. Okay, good. Um, a couple of folks have asked about air layering um, versus grafting on some of these fruit trees. You know, I think they got the message of that sexual maturity coming in from that scion, but um, I know that lychee and longan are often air, air layered, but what about avocado and mango? Good question. I did specifically say grafting for those because you need the really good roots for avocado and mango. Lychee, longan, and probably guava you can air layer and get away with it. Um, but for the other ones, it's much better to have a good strong seedling like sapodilla, canistel, mame, avocado, um, mango, and then graft them. Okay. You could get it to work with an air layer, but once you get in the ground, it, it wouldn't do well because the roots wouldn't be strong enough. Right, so the rootstock is important selection as part of that, that plant. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, Deborah wants to know how should a mango tree be pruned? Um, and my question is, do you feel like mangoes need to be pruned yearly? So I start pruning mangoes almost as soon as I plant them in the ground. I start tipping them to get them to branch out. So they have many branches instead of just one or two. Um, so that's what I do for the first about two or three years. Then after that, if it flowers and fruits, then I prune it and I'm looking for any strong verticals that I'm gonna knock out to keep it going horizontal. And yes, I would prune annually for sure. Uh, and then, like I said, look for those strong verticals, try to take those out, do a little tipping, um, and keep it in, in, in good shape. And even then still not removing more than one third of the tree at any time, right? Right. Okay. Because that okay. will make it want to put out more leaves. So. so here's an interesting question. How long can I safely wait after I pull the last mango to prune? Well, it depends on the cultivar because some of them you might pull it in September and some of them you've already pulled it. Right. So I would say don't go past October. Don't go past Halloween with your pruning. Yeah, because that might initiate a spurt of growth that could get caught in a cold snap or something like that. I know in Central Florida, we would be more concerned with that too. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, is, uh, are there any homeowner treatments for anthracnose on the mangoes? Yeah, anthracnose, you treat it with copper. And the, you, you can use copper as a homeowner. Um, what I would do is I would keep the tree well pruned so it's getting a lot of air, it's getting a lot of sunlight. Uh, you can also pick cultivars that are ready earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. So they're not gonna be so susceptible to anthracnose. Like a lot of those ones I showed you, except for Neelum, they're all early. So they would be ready 
before a lot of humidity and rain starts affecting them. Oh, you're so smart, Jeff. That's so good. Okay, great advice there. So some of the cultivars that Jeff recommended earlier are going to be picked earlier before we get so hot and humid that the anthracnose is going to go nuts on the fruit. Okay, wonderful advice. Okay, um, Kelly has, uh, she's got a question about trees and plants that have hermaphroditic flowers. Will the plants with hermaphroditic flowers produce offspring that will also have hermaphroditic flowers or will they produce diverse offsprings with some having hermaphroditic flowers, some female flowers, as well as some male flowers? So the, the fruit that I know that has her, her, hermaphrodite flowers, hermaphroditic flowers uh, is papaya. Papaya will have a male, mm -hmm. it'll have a female, and then it can have both. That's one right. where it kind of switches around. Most of them, if it's one way, it's always gonna be that way for the seedlings except for papaya. And you can get one that is a hermaphrodite, but it only, it, then it has, let's say hundred seeds, 20 of those could be males, 20 could be females, and the rest could be hermaphrodites. Oh, wow. But for the most part, it's gonna be the same as the parent. Right. Um, okay, how does pruning change the concept of drip line for fertilization? That's a good question because if you're keeping the tree smaller but the roots continue to grow, uh, then the drip line is further than what you what you see. So you will know of your own tree how much you've pruned it, how old it is. So if you've done a lot of pruning and you really kept it tight, then I would go out much further with my drip line fertilizer. But if you have done only very little, I wouldn't go out that much further. Yeah. Um, great answer. Is the mite, uh, the iridophid mite also affecting long gan? Only lychee. Only lychee. Very interesting. Um, question about guava. My volunteer guavas are uh, kind of top heavy. No foliage until like four feet up. And so many fruits that they are tipping over. How hard can I prune them after harvest by myself slash the squirrels, etc.? Well, guava is a tree that you can prune a little more than 30%. You can prune it a little harder and you will come back nice. So I, I think you can prune, you know, 50% of that and you still be okay. Yeah. And guava flowers come out on the new growth. So okay. you're producing new growth. So that's a good thing. Yeah, for me, Sandra, on that, if I had a four foot tall guava, I probably would bring it down to about two, two and a half feet. I'm just throwing that out. It's hard when it's a big whip like that, but you know, that's kind of what Jeff said too. Um, let's see, hold on, here we go. Uh, la la la. Proper planting. They're wondering about proper planting. Back to proper planting. I was surprised to discover that I did not backfill my plants well enough when they weren't growing. I poked around and found pockets all around the roots and then added, filled that in and then that worked. So yeah, a lot of air pockets happen. Jeff, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, air pockets are not great. So when you do your planting, do a little backfill, get at the right level and then push in that native soil back in there and then take the other side of your shovel and just get it down there, try to get rid of those holes, put, put the hose on it, try to get rid of those holes and then backfill it. You don't right. want and the holes. With that, um, with the rocky soils down there, and wait, I got to show you, I have another show and tell. Because everybody from the Redland always has their own little soil sample. I've got my, you got one too, Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> This is the soil I grew up with, you guys. This is why I like, oh, yours is bigger, of course. That's good. <laughs> this is our soil in South Florida. So um, uh, that's even more important. And so when you come in with that organic soil, it just kind of gets absorbed by all those pockets. So it's really important to make sure that those air pockets are taken care of. Okay, uh, my custard apple tree has a bit of weed whack damage. It's still alive. Should you give up on it? Should you replant? What should you do? And why are weed whackers such a problem in South Florida? <laughs> uh, if they're still producing leaves at a pretty good rate, I wouldn't give up on it. I would make sure that you know it, it is protected and doesn't happen again. 
um, but I wouldn't give up on it if it's still producing a good amount of leaves. Yeah, uh, and just, you know, yeah. know that one day it might fail if, the, if that trunk is a little bit, you know. All right, um, let's see. Is early fruit drop a normal phenomenon to be expected? And then to that, Jeff, someone also wanted to know at what age should we allow a tree to carry a full crop? When you say early fruit drop, I'm not sure if they mean when the tree is young or early on in the, well, either way, it's, it's, it's normal to get fruit drop. That's completely normal. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, and what was your second question? Uh, how, how, how old should a tree go oh, how old, we yeah. let it hold a full crop? Um, I wouldn't go so much by the age, I would go by the size. So if it's a good two feet across, it can probably hold one or two fruit. If it's three feet, you can let it do whatever it's going to do. Um, but I would say normally it's two to three years. Two to three years, yeah. Okay, this is probably one of the harder questions of the day. Um, how do you know when a sapodilla is ready? Do you do a nick test? You do. You do the same thing you do with um, meme, but instead of seeing green, you're going to see like a white sap if it's not ready, and you're going to see like sort of cinnamon brown if it is ready. Yeah, great. Um, Basim uh, Halal wants to know if we can grow jackfruit in Central Florida. I don't know. I would give it a shot. You know, Baz, I think that um, if you planted it on a south wall and were prepared to protect it um, in, a, in a real cold snap, you'd be okay. And Kelly has seen people growing jackfruit in Orlando, so that's good. Um, and Loretta from Orange County wants to know, how do you know when to pick a mango? Um, most mangoes are going to have what's called color break, where they go from just kind of being pretty on the tree to being really spectacular. Like a glen will be sort of orangish, but when it's ready, it's like a bright orange. So that's one way is you'll see these color breaks. But some of them don't really have a big color break, but you can see that their shoulders get wider. When the shoulders are fat, that's when they're probably mature. If you have a tree, let's say you had 50 mangoes on the tree and you weren't sure if they were ready yet, but they all look about the same size, you can actually take one off and start using a knife and getting closer and closer to the seed. And if you see some discoloration, not discoloration, but if you see some color around the seed, that tells you that it's mature and that it's going um, to ripen if you pick it. Okay. Um, have you had any experience with finger limes? Not myself. I'm trying to get one down here. If anybody has one that they want to donate, to them, that would be great. Okay. I did see some in California. They're super thorny, so they're very hard to pick. Oh. I know that there's some commercial growers here that have some. Uh, they're being hush-hush about it because they're getting good, um, good money for them. Yeah. Um, can you eat the fruit of a tree with citrus greening? Yes. Okay. Um, do you need to remove the first fruit of the tree to encourage root development? I think we've covered that one, so. If it's real small, yes. If it's not, no. Okay. Uh, Josette wants to know what month does Canistel usually produce fruit and where can we, where can you find it? I have a tree in the grove here and it's producing right now. And where can you find to buy the tree? If you go to my webpage, if you, if you search Miami Dade Extension Tropical Fruit, you'll find my page. And there, there's a list of all the tropical fruit nurseries. OK, I want you to say that one more time, Jeff. OK, so if you've ever gotten an email from me, down at the bottom, it says commercial tropical fruit information. You can click on that. It'll go to my page or uh, you can just search Miami Dade Extension Tropical Fruit. Okay. And that has my page and it has all kinds of information. It will have a lot of stuff we talked about today. It has packing houses, it has fertilizer companies, it has where you can buy fruit trees. So that would help you find your canistel. 
tons of information. Okay, great. Um, if your young tree is planted a little too deep, can you safely pull up the tree a little bit or reset it? I think if it's young enough, yes. Okay, and for Basm, um, we're getting a lot of people in Orange County growing jackfruit, so that's good to know. Paulette Johnson wants to know if, uh, wanted you to know that there's finger limes down the street from you at the Fruit and Spice Park, so you can head on down there and see if they'll share with you. And also at, in, uh, at Lake Alford, they have finger limes to share from what I understand, so that's good to know. Um, Tammy is looking for advice on growing passion fruit in Cocoa Beach, uh, the dark skin variety. Do you grow any passion fruit and can you share about that? We have some here. I'm not a, I don't, I've never grown them myself, so I don't have a ton of experience. I do know that you can grow them easily from cuttings and that's the best way to propagate them by cuttings. So if you have someone that has what you want, uh, get cuttings and grow it using cuttings. Um, but also it has a virus that if mm. the mother plant has it and you take cuttings, you're going to have the virus. And then the virus is pretty prevalent. So be on the lookout for that. Mm, fascinating. Uh, here's a question you'll have a quick answer to. Uh, Anne De DeBablo has a grafted mango tree, uh, has a variety name, but she can't find a reference. She forgot the name of it. She doesn't know. Where's a good place to search mango varietal names? Mm, there's, there's some books, but they're out of print. The best place that I know of right now is Pine Island Nursery. They have a mango viewer and it has a good amount of mangoes there. So if it's yes. something that's a newer variety, it will probably show up there. Great. Good. Um, what about Rambutan? Um, can Rambutan be grown in Central Florida? Rambutan is uh, ultra sensitive to cold, so we can't even grow it here. So yeah. no. Right, you can't even grow it here. And then Dina Wild from Orange County, speaking of, um, um, asked about the climate change affecting tropical fruit production. What are what are we seeing? And I, and I know something anecdotally, um, you know that. Uh, that some of these some of these plants are actually being able to be grown further north. But what are you, what are you seeing, Jeff? I would agree with that. Uh, we we know that it's warmer and it's warmer further north. Uh, we're seeing that with the lychees. Like I said, they need a certain amount of cool temperatures, and a lot of times we're not getting them here. So because it's too warm. So um, I think that's a, a reality that we're going to continue to see. Wow, that's really interesting. Uh, Lisa wants to know which nurseries are best for mangoes. So you mentioned Pine Island. Someone else said Zill's Nursery. And is there another one that you might throw out there? I would say look at my list. I'm okay. not going to pick one over the other. I will say though, Zill though is, is only wholesale. I see. And isn't there somebody over in Naples too? So maybe there's some different ones. Um, and uh, Sarah has papaya trees started from seed that are not fruiting. Maybe it's the age or it's a male female issue. Yeah, I would look, see if it's flowered and it could be a male or they could be males. The male flower is, is all wonky. It looks kind of weird. Uh, so you could look up the difference between the male and the female flowers yeah. and see if you have a male, if it has already flowered. They flower pretty quick. They don't take as long as the other ones. Right. Good. Um, someone's asking about um, Philippine and Namdok Mai mangoes for Palm Beach County. Uh, I would say yes. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I love a good Namdok Mai. Uh, uh, here's someone asking about a small mango tree. Um, and uh, maybe a little bit more of a dwarf variety. Yeah, a lot of the ones I mentioned are, I wouldn't say dwarfy. We don't have a true dwarf mango tree, but they have a little bit shorter inner nodes and they grow a little slower. Uh, and then with pruning, you can keep them at a good size. So I would say something like an Angie, Malika, Fairchild, um, even a Glen. I didn't mention Glen, but a Glen stays a little smaller. 
you're never if you just plant a mango and leave it alone it's going to get 40 feet there's right. no mango that's just going to sit there but those that you just mentioned kind of they're comfortable being at about 15 20 feet right yes yeah okay. right if you want something really small uh you're going to have to become a, a bonsai expert somebody recommended pickering as a small mango okay uh sounds good sounds good um Pat Andrews is wondering about mangoes in North Florida as far as Jacksonville. I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, and then Ed wants to know if all the fruit trees discussed today have both male and female separate flowers. And I'll let you answer that. Uh, only jackfruit for the most part. Uh, there are some I didn't mention, like um, papaya that we said has either male, female, or both. There's also one called Mamea Americana that the tree can be all male or all female. So you gotta get that one grafted because you don't want a male just hanging around doing nothing as usual. And then you have <laughs> black sapote, also called the chocolate pudding fruit. That one is also either all male or all female. Jackfruit is male and female separate on the same tree. Black sapote is all female or all male. So you've got to get one that's grafted to know that it's a female that will fruit. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. Um, Yen Chan wants to know, does Papa belong to the mango family? Papa? Yeah, Papa. Oh, Papa. Uh, I think that's a Nona. It is a Nona. Um, I'll, I, 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 I know what I think, but what do you think the official answer to uh, the question, uh, I want to plant citrus? I would say no. Yeah. Just because it's going to be tough. I mean, you get a tree that looks good, and but citrus greening is, I haven't seen an area where it's not there. So the official answer is, we don't say no and we don't say yes. We give them the information about citrus screening as much as we can and explain to them that this tree will most likely get citrus screening within two, within a short amount of time. Um, so that's kind of the that's kind of the official word. What she um, said. Yeah. <laughs> My uh, three-year-old Wurtz avocado starts with many avocado fruit, then it all drops off. Um Fruit drop is normal that much. If everything's dropping off, that's not normal. And I would try fertilizing with a little more potassium that kind of help those hold on. Okay, Deborah, you heard that more potassium. Oh my goodness. Um, because of the forbidden fertilizer of nitrogen from June, they must have a fertilizer regulation in their county. Um, what's a good fertilizer schedule for mangoes and citrus? So Josette, I would ask you to check your fertilizer regulations because oftentimes edibles are not included in that. But Jeff, what would you say? Yeah, we just had a new sweeping rule go into place here with fertilizers. And I think fruit trees are, they, you, you cannot fertilize them. I don't know the exact months, uh, but I would go with a lot of compost and things like that where you can get your trees fed without officially putting out um, too much nitrogen and phosphorus. And remember, potassium is the one that really helps the trees. And I don't think for us, potassium is being regulated. Okay. Don't quote and, me on that, but look that up. I think that's right. Okay. All and that, then, all that what time. about a good slow release right before the regulations kick in? That sounds delightful. Okay. Oh my gosh, Jeff, are you tired? The questions are not stopping. Um, let's I was see. a middle school teacher, so this is nothing. Okay. <laughs> um, so are there any tropical fruit trees small enough to grow in uh, fruit and in pots in North Florida? Uh, pots to move into a greenhouse for freezes. Mm, I would say probably um, miracle fruit. Yep, miracle fruit, papaya. That's a real small one. Um, uh, you know, I would even, you know, if you were a little bit crazy, I might even try a carambola because that's kind of a small tree, depending on how big your greenhouse is. Um, 
but yeah. avocado and mango, I don't, I do not think are uh, adaptable to that uh, culture method. No. How do you address or block animals from taking mangoes and avocados? She's seen some neighbors who put the fruit in a in hosiery or put a bag on them. I've had, I think squirrels are incredibly uh, hard workers and they're very smart and they're gonna beat you to your fruit almost every time. So my patented answer is I plant two mango trees and I give one to the squirrels and one for myself. Okay. But we know that's not really gonna work. Uh, and you can't, it's very difficult to keep squirrels away from your, your fruit trees. But one thing you can do is really watch the fruit and when it's mature, not ripe, but mature, pick it before the squirrels start getting into it. But it's very difficult. Um, you could try bagging the fruit, but you know, if you have 50 fruit, fruit on a tree, that's difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Anna Bonstead over in Lee County said she saw a Kent mango, uh, no more than eight feet tall, loaded with fruits. Let me know where that is, because I want to go pick it. And can you explain why mature avocado trees flower profusely and but don't really set fruit or you know you'll see so many flowers and you only get maybe a half a dozen fruit or 12 fruit uh, if the tree is really mature like very old then it's going to start declining uh, if you have a normal let's say 20 year old avocado tree and it's just full of flowers but then it doesn't really set fruit i would give it more potassium, like I mentioned earlier. Um, it's normal to drop a lot of flowers because there's a very small percentage of flowers that actually get pollinated. But if you're seeing bloom, 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 and never any fruit, then that's an issue. Number one, it could be it's a bad seedling. But if you have a good cultivar and you're still getting that, then I would try to add some more potassium to your lineup. OK. Um... And a couple of folks um, are wondering, um, finger limes aren't blooming and they did uh, the patented uh, Jeff CSI and still didn't come up and had idealized everything. Um, and wondering if you know why a finger lime wouldn't bloom. I don't know. I'm Like I said, I haven't been able to grow any myself. I know Paulette says they're down the street, but that's not the same as me actually growing them. So I don't know. Okay. What would be causing that? Um, yeah, uh, somebody was asking about the ideal time to um, do air layers and what's the best time to cut budwood for grafting? Now is a real good time to do air layers, cuttings, and grafting. Uh, yeah. When it's humid and it's warm and things are growing, that's a good time. Um, the only one that you really graft out of season and when it's cooler is avocado. Everything else you go, now is a great time to do it. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to trek in about an hour from now and I'm gonna air layer a tree that they wanna move um, and they might lose it. So they wanna have a backup of the tree. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it'll work. Um, yeah, so Kelly just asked, is avocado best grafted in the fall or spring? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that was probably in its cool, cooler, yeah. Fall is not bad. Fall is not bad. Spring's better. Spring, fall or spring. Okay. Can avocado trees be pruned to keep short? Yes, you can keep them. When we say short, though, we're talking like twenty by twenty. But yeah, you can <laughs> you can keep them. You know, maybe fifteen by twenty. Okay, maybe so 15. it's all uh, it's that's all relative. Yeah. Um, so Richard's asking, what about foliar feeding for HLB on citrus? Um, we didn't really talk that much about HLB, but you can go ahead and answer that, Jeff. Yeah, like I said, HLB, um, you're, you're, the roots are starting to die off. So foliar feeding is going to help because you're getting the plant fed without using the roots. Right. Feed, feeding is going to help. And so if you want to do foliar feeding, I think that's excellent too. Um, Carrie, who wins the contest for most questions asked today, um, wants to know if her papaya tree died, her papaya tree died after about three years. Is that pretty much normal? Yeah, that's pretty normal. 
Okay. And can we use 8212 on mango? Mm, probably want a little less nitrogen, but that's better than 839. Okay. And then somebody, was it Paulette that said, yes, uh, that Trex recommending 0022 for um, mature mangoes? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, because for a mature tree, you know, it probably it's that uh, potassium that's needed. So yeah, and you could use that same ratio for some of these trees we talked about that aren't that are flowering but not setting. How did you not talk about bananas today, Jeff? <laughs> you know well, it's my favorite. <laughs> I gotta add that into my rotation. Okay. All right. Very good. I uh, I think we are about wrapped up and and if you get a, you get to go sit down and have a, a nice refreshing uh, mango smoothie somewhere so you can relax. So, okay, I appreciate uh, it. Thanks for I, the invitation. I really, really appreciate all your answers and your excellent presentation today. I think I've got, got a lot of people thinking and uh, able to answer a lot of questions that come into the uh, Master Gardener tables and uh, clinics and uh, phone hotlines. And yes, we will have the presentation is was recorded, is recorded, and will be posted on the MG website. And um, Jeff, thank you so much. You're always awesome. And I'm hoping that everybody wants to tune in for Tropical Tuesdays. I'm going to go ahead and post Jeff's website as well as his email address. Um, let me see. I'm going to go ahead and pop it in there right now if you need it. There it is. It's sflhort at ufl.edu, like South Florida horticulture, but sflhort at ufl.edu. I just popped it in there. And uh, Jeff, we'll see you next time. Hopefully we'll All see right. you in Panama City in a few weeks, right? All right, coming thank up. you so much. I appreciate okay. the invitation. Bye-bye. All right, take Bye. care. Bye-bye.